Society, and I am delighted to partner with the Battle of Rhode Island Association for this fabulous talk. I am a, an architectural historian, so I'm super excited about um, all of the, uh, the content of this talk. It's going to be really fabulous. Um, we have a couple of housekeeping items. Please silence your cell phones. I promise I have done that to mine. Um, those of you who are on Zoom, um, I'm going to be very forceful about no video and no um, audio. And that's just because not everybody's uh, internet is the same, and we found that if um, less uh, information is going through Wi-Fi, it helps a lot with um, how good the quality is on the other side. That's what I thought. Um, if you have questions on Zoom, please uh, throw them in the chat. We're going to have lots of uh, opportunity for questions, and obviously those in the room, hold them till the end, stick your hands up, um, and uh, we're going to have a good time. So, um, have I forgotten anything housekeeping-wise? Seems good. All right. Um, excellent. So I am delighted to welcome uh, Dr. John K. Robertson, and I opted for the short bio. The long bio is in his book, and it is fabulous. So I, I, I hate to sell you short right off the bat, but we can all, you know, be just overwhelmed with your uh, fabulous credentials, and I'm so excited about your work. He has, this is the first of four books, by the way, that Dr. Robertson has in, uh, in, in the works. So John K. Robertson, PhD, is a colonel, retired, um, from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers with 23 years of experience of service, and he served on the faculty at West Point. He is co-owner, editor of the RevWar75.com website. He is a fellow and chair of the Endowment Fund Committee of the Company of Military Historians. His research interests include military justice, the militia in the American War for Independence, and Rhode Island in the War. And we are so excited to welcome you to talk about this book today. Thank you, Dr. Robertson. Take it away. Thank you all for having me here. Ah, this stupid, the, if you don't push it every second, it times out. Okay. okay. The book that we're going to talk about today is the second of book that was published by the Rhode Island Publication Society and supported by the Heritage Harbor Foundation. The, the, the first book is uh, the minutes of the Council of War and the uh, Recess Committee. That was published about three years ago. And there's a, another book that will be about, I call it the Defenders of Rhode Island, and it's about the troop units from all the states that have served in Rhode Island during the American Revolution. And I think you'll find that one very interesting. <laughs> okay, what you're gonna to see tonight, you're gonna to be seeing a lot of maps. Um, you're used to seeing maps with North at the top. And in the time of, of the Revolution, they didn't care. <laughs> so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take all the maps and reorient them so they all look with North at the top. That makes comparing different maps easier. And it also means that some labels will be upside down and you find them hard to read. We're going to look at two places tonight, Britain, the fort that was on Breton's Point and the fort that's at Windmill Hill or Butts Hill. Breton's Point opposite Newport. This is uh, a 1776 map by um, Oh, yeah, Blaskowitz. I just need to get to my notes. I'm going to just spend more time here. And he shows the fort on here as a small piece. And if you blow it up, it looks like it's just a small crescent. The question is, is this what the fort looked like, or is it really, was something else really there? The description that Blaskowitz gives, not on this published map, but on his manuscript map that he made the pu published map from, says that this fort had 30 guns, a mixture of 18 and 24 pounders, which is a lot for a little redoubt like that. So I went looking to see, is this really the map? The first version of the map, or what I think is the, of the fort, is 
found in uh, John Palmer's diary. Don, John Palmer was a, an enlisted aide to Colonel Commandant Henry Babcock in the Rhode Island State Brigade that was in the state and built this and three other forts. You can see it has a battery out here that faces towards the Narragansett Bay. These up here, they face towards the harbor. And then there's one lonely gun on the bottom that faces towards the, the rest of the peninsula. This is a map from the Clements Library. It's a British map made in, well, it has no date. So this, this map is not, this plan is not dated, it has, uh, but there are a series of plans in the Clements Library. There's this fort, there's one on, uh, I gotta look at my notes, cannot do it. Goat Island, and then they have plans for maps up at the northern end of the island all right after they got there in December of 76. So while this one's not dated, it fits that they're documenting the forts that were, that it, were existing in the harbor, and this is their plan. And you'll see, if you compare this with the Palmer map, they're almost exactly the same. Same number of gun ports. The thing that you want to note here, 16 embrasures, but behind the embrasures, there's a symbol for the platforms, the wooden platforms on which the guns mounted. So we got more information. There are two barracks in here. This, this copy doesn't show. Over here on, come on. There's something there and something here, and I think from reading the other material, that those, one of those is the magazine for the fort. It may be, hard to, may be hard to see, but from here down to here is an indication of a cross section. And we're going to show you the cross section so you can get an idea of what the fort looked like. The inside of the fort is over here. The outside of the fort, the fort that the facing down the peninsula is over here. And you'll notice that they have pickets in there or, or palisades, or you, you might also have heard them called phrase, F-R-A-I-S-E, long poles to slow the enemy down. The rest of it is pretty standard fort. This is a, a, a photo of readout number nine at Yorktown, and you can see what the phrases look like when they're in there. These are um, all three or four inch logs, sharpened. I'm not sure why they're sharpened. I don't know anybody that would jump up there to get impaled, but it certainly would, if you were trying to get from down here in the, in the ditch and work your way up, they certainly would slow you down, and that's their purpose. They're there to keep you from getting into the fort real quickly. So they're close enough together so that a guy like me could never get by, but a skinny guy might. This is looking the other way from the top down. And just to get you on some standard names that you're going to see, the inside of the fort is over here at the parade. The terror plane is the piece of ground on which if there's a, a gun, you'd build the, the platform, the wooden platform for the gun. The place that the men fire from is the banquet. And then they fire down this slope. The mode, of course, is to slow people down. And this picture doesn't show it, but this part over here also slopes you, you want to keep anybody that's coming close to you in view. This is a 1777 map. So the, we put this forward in in 1776. We're anxious to see what's happened. 
from the British records, we know that the British didn't use this fort in 1777 or in 1778 until the French came. When the rumor came that the French were coming, the British rebuilt this and regunned it. Uh, this is a, a map from 1779, a, a British map. Again, everything looks just like it had. So when the British rebuilt in 1778, they didn't seem to change very much. We do know that they added some embrasures in the back so that they, they could fire into the harbor in case anybody got into the harbor. French map. The next guys that come are the Rochambeau in 1780. You'll notice in this version of the map, we've got something happened to the fort. Maybe. And just to let you know, all the straight lines on here are cannons, cannons shooting a straight line. The curved lines that you see are mortars. And the legend for the thing says 24, 12 24 pounders and four mortars were, were in this fort. Another French map, same date, looks just like we had. So which is the right one? Let's see what else we can find. This is a, a Navy map. <laughs> and you can see they've got this sawtooth work in here. All the embrasures are at the north end of that, and the piece on the, to the left is a, a, a wall to protect the, the gunners from guys out here in the boat shooting at them, which makes sense. But is this really what happened? Oh, and, and down here on the bottom, uh, down here on the bottom, that's the four mortars. And there are 12 embrasures in there. So it's showing the same 24 pounders in there and the same number of guns, but it's just this ugly, this is an undated plan of the harbor while the French are there. You can see the, these are the, the French encampment up on the hill behind the harbor. And it's got our fort. And then there's two other little forts that the French built. And that's really what we, we know about this fort. It was continued to be used by the Americans after the French. French left in July of 1781. They went up to Providence and then marched over to the Hudson River. What happened to it then? The Americans continued to use it. And the latest I can find it being used is July 4th, 1782. In the orders for the celebration, they fired the guns from this fort. Okay, let's talk about Windmill Hill. I know that's not a windmill. <laughs> Why was it called Windmill Hill? Gloria. <laughs> if you haven't been to Gloria's website on Portsmouth history, she's got good analysis of the property records and and who owned what and why it was called Windmill Hill. There was a Windmill Hill. It was built in 1648, I think, yep. 1668. And eventually it was sold to John Butts. That's how we get Butts Hill. And he bought it in 1725. We don't know if the windmill stayed in use up until the revolution. British maps that we have do not show it. There are no American maps for that period, so we just have no idea if it was there. I find nothing where they say they took it down to, to build the fort. So that's one of the questions we still have. Okay, let's get past that. This is what the north end of, of Aquidneck Island looked like during 
just before the British came in, 17, in December of 1776. At that point, there were two forts that the Americans had built on the island. One was this little star-shaped fort over here by Howland's Ferry, and the other one was a pretty substantial redoubt at Bristol Ferry. When the British came, they used neither initially. This one over here never was used because you've got Fort Barton there breathing down their neck, so it's an untenable position. This one up here, when we finally put our batteries in up here at the, on the Bristol side, they were wrecking havoc. The, the British initially were uh, entrenching along the shore by the ferry, and we were just driving them out of there con continually. So they, they said, hey, you know, there's a nice fort up there. Why don't we move up the hill? And so they re rebuilt it and, and, and re eventually took it over. Okay, this is uh, the seven, same area in 1778, and just, this is a Lieutenant Fagg's map of the raid on um, Bristol and Warren. And I've just, it's the only map I have for that time period, but it shows all the British forts that they put in. They're now using Bristol Ferry. They built one here at the top of the road that goes down to Common Fence. Neck, that's they call the common fence redoubt. There's a road that goes down here to this neck, and there's a bridge here, so this became the bridge redoubt. They started something early in 1777 at Windmill Hill. Actually, 1776. Let me get my name. December 8, 1776, Deputy Governor Bradford wrote to Governor and said, the British are entrenching along the shore and they're about a mile back, which would be Windmill Hill, they're beginning to do something. So that started in December. And our source for most of our information about what the British did was Mackenzie's diary. Mackenzie goes to New York for six months in the spring, so we, we have a gap of real good intelligence of what the British are doing. And then this one is on the map says Burrington, Burrington Hill Redoubt. It's also called the Artillery Redoubt. That's on, on, but what you've got here when the British are, are, are defending the north part of the island is a series of interlocking forts. Each one can fire on the other one. So if you're trying to attack any one of them, the forts on either side can rain so it's very hard to attack. This is the same kind of thing you had at West Point, where you had all the redoubts were interlocking and, and there was no safety. I bring that up because when we get to the French version of Butts Hill, there's only gonna be one fort up there and the whole style of how you build the fort changes because of that. Okay, this is our friend uh, Blaskowitz, 1776. Shows the battery. Well, the battery is this curved line, and we're not sure what that is. It's not labeled. It's probably the magazine, because everything else after this time has a magazine. The only thing wrong with this is that's Butts Hill. <laughs> <laughs> so whoever was feeding Blaskowitz's information on the forts gave him a list of information and stuff, and he put it on his, his map just before publication real quick. And there are a lot of errors in that. If you, there are a lot of um, descriptions of how many guns and what sizes, and they're very wrong on the Blaskowitz map when you compare them with other sources. This is the first British map we have up there. This is the, uh, well, it's not British, it's really a Hessian, the Schiffer, was a lieutenant in the, the Hessian artillery, but he made us this, this nice map. And this is June, so we have to go back and explain. In the winter, from November 
until June, the British went into quarters. In the spring, usually the end of May, beginning of June, they came out and camped in tents for health reasons. So this is the encampment that came here in May. We've got two Hessian regiments up here, three English regiments. One of those, the middle one, the 22nd, moves out. We know the date of that, so we can date this map pretty accurately as to, to when it occurred. And then the other little piece there, that's the artillery park for the north. The British and the Americans both operated on a system where it used an artillery park. You had all the guns together in one place with crews, and when somebody attacked somewhere and you needed a gun, you asked for it, and they'd send a team out instead of having guns placed in places that never got attacked. So that's the purpose of the artillery up there. No date on this one, but we know that the Merlins, uh, let me jump ahead here. You ready? A Merlin is this high piece on either side of an embrasure. It allows the gun to shoot through, keeps the walls up high, the parapet up high so it protects the crew, but it also restricts how that gun can be aimed. It's limited by the angle on the opening. When this was first built, they had six guns up here. But when boats were coming in through Bristol Ferry opening, Thornton River, is that what they call that? They couldn't follow the boat with the gun because they kept hitting the sides of the embrasures. And they decided, no one's going to attack us. They can't get on the land and get up to us because we got all those other forts out there. So let's get rid of the Merlins. And one of the versions we're going to see in a minute, you'll see the, 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 they were done away with. Also note the change from, from the uh, earlier map in 1707 to this one. We now have another compound here. That's a redoubt, and there are two wooden pads in here for howitzers. So we'll go into howitzers in a minute. All around this fort, this squiggly line that you see here are actually meant to be tree branches that have been placed there, pointed ends out towards the, the incoming troops. The purpose, slow the troops down, keep them in the field of fire longer so we can get, get, get them. I could not, there are no pictures of the revolution. <laughs> Christian McBurney drives me crazy. He says, well, why don't you put a picture in there? I said, there are no pictures in the Cameras weren't invented until 18 something. But this is a Civil War abatee. And you can see that that's a pretty effective barrier. And if you've ever had to try and go against one of those, it's a pain. The way you breach that and get through to the works, that's the, that's the ditch and the, the guns and stuff. I cut them off when I did this. Cause, so the way you breach this is, is you use grappling hooks. You take a, a small anchor or something with, and a rope and you throw it in there grab it and you try and pull it out because what do you want to do? You want to get through fast. So you clear gaps in the line so you can get in. That's how you, you work against Abatee. Uh, we're ready to talk about guns. Three kinds of artillery. Mortars, high angle, and what, you want to do, what that is for is to drop in behind the defenses and kill the troops or wound them. They fire shells. Shells is a hollow metal sphere with a fuse on it, and the fuses are timed so that it blows up when it gets there. Guns are 
low trajectory. They shoot ball, solid cast iron balls, or they can shoot what's called canister, which is a metal box filled with little balls, or grape shot, which is a bunch of little balls that are held together in a canvas bag, and the bag bursts in the air, so you get all these little things flying out. So that, so anti-personnel, it's also the, the big heavy balls are trying to work on penetrating this fortress to break it down. And it, it should be obvious that how big the parapet, how thick the parapet is, is a function of what kind of guns you think are going to come against you. A musket will shoot about one foot six inches into a parapet, into a, a dirt wall. Some cannons with a heavy shell will go 10 or more feet. So depends on what your enemy's got. We talked a little about the Merlins here. When you take the Merlins away, then you're firing what's called a French term en bonbet. You're shooting the gun over the wall, but you've lost all your protection. If your fort is inland, like Butts Hill, this is a good arrangement. It gives you, you can aim a gun anywhere and not have to worry. Now, if you, when the French come and build, they're not going to have all those other little forts out there. So I would suspect, but we don't see it on their maps, that the French are going to go back to the, this kind of a system. You notice two different kinds of carriages for the guns. This is a field carriage. You take the gun anywhere if you have enough men to pull it, or a horse or oxen. These are garrison carriages, or very similar to ship's carriages. They meant to work on this wooden platform. This is the end of 1777. The map itself, the plan itself is on dated, and you can see where I've had to turn it to get it right angle. But we now have two compounds up here next to each other. The old battery of six guns, the magazine. We now have a um, redoubt around something. At some point, that changes from being howitzers to they, they finally build the barracks up in there. And then later, they decide that they need barracks for all the men that are at the north end for the winter. So they build this barracks down here. This one is built for 300 officers and men. And December 1st, Mackenzie reports 254 officers and men housed in the barracks and another 45 over here. And you'll notice no embrasures. So this is how the, everybody says, well, what was the plan? There was no plan. This is, they did what they needed at the time and, and the thing grew. Okay, now we're up to Sullivan's expedition in August of 78. As soon as the French came in on August the 8th, they had prearranged that all the troops at the north end would be drawn back into the, the lines around Newport. They had removed most of the guns but prior to that. There were two guns that were left. They were old iron guns and they spiked those and left them in place. And if you don't know what spiking is, essentially they drive a nail in the, the vent hole so you can't light the gun off. And with enough time and good people, you can drill those out later, and the British do that. After the 8th, when they, 
vamoosed out of the North End, General Sullivan used the fort as his headquarters until they got rid of the rain and they were able to move south towards Newport. So he was only there six days. During those six days, they needed to make some changes in those forts. Uh, I'm going to mess with you again. All these guns were out against the enemy. These were all focused that way too. We only have that arc pointing to the northeast. These pointed north also. Sullivan's coming on the island. What does he want to do? He wants to protect himself from the British. So what do we got to do? We got to modify the forts to enable us to file south and at the British. So that's happening in those, that time period. Okay, we're going back. Oh, come on. During this period where Sullivan was there, he, he had a lot of modifications to the forts. Between the 15th and the 28th, they were down digging the, the approach trenches to try and get into Newport. When they realized the French weren't coming back, they made plans to retreat. So the troops used it from the 28th to the 30th, but Sullivan sent people back on the 25th to build up those forts again, so that because he expected the British to follow. Once the Americans got over to Tiverton, the British reoccupied the positions. And there are, no, Mackenzie comments in his diary, I was so glad that we didn't rip those things down and have to rebuild them. We saved ourselves a lot of work. Okay, so now, all of a sudden, in October of 1779, General Clinton decides to pull the troops out of Newport. So when they left, what did they do? In this particular fort, we don't think very much. I, I, the guys in Tiverton are daily, well, not, not daily, two or three times a day are sending intelligence reports to General Gates telling him they're moving troops to take the tents down today. But otherwise, they're still there. They didn't burn anything up here. Down in Newport, they did some burning. So we really don't know what's going on up there. We have Mackenzie left in uh, January of 78. So we go into a dead period from January of 78 until they leave with almost no information. Did the Americans use the fort? Yes, but not for long. When the British pulled out on the 25th, the morning of the 26th, troops came from Bristol down to the north end, and the first thing they occupied was Butts Hill. And that was Gates's command post. There were other movements of troops because you had and Gell's troops over on the uh, western shore that came across. We don't know to exactly where, but they, they did come across on the 26th. And you have some that are in Tiverton that came across, but we don't have those orders. So we're a little bit in the dark on that too. But Gates used it probably for that day. And then he moved down because the orders that, that night start in Newport. And after that, nothing happens until the French come in 1780. So there's a year and a half where we don't think, I don't think, I, I don't know if you guys believe me or not, but I don't think that they 
it was used at all because it, it didn't fit in with our scheme. We were worried about protecting Newport from an invasion. The inland stuff didn't matter anymore. Rochambeau decided to change the fort, to rebuild it. He didn't like it. He wanted it as a, he, wanted, he was concerned because they were on an island about keeping the communications. So that means the Bristol Ferry and Howland's Ferry open. And he was also concerned about the security of his stores and ammunition and stuff. So the big change here is we go to one fort, not the two that the British ended up with. Remember, the British, we had a compound around the, the, the barracks, and there was another one for the, the battery. The French change it into one. And note this version, direction for the, this one is almost north-south, the barracks. Oh, I'll show you it in a second. Who built it? We have very good records. We have uh, two orderly books from the, the Massachusetts troops that did the work. Four regiments of militia that were, were here at General Heath's in, uh, command. And they started building at, at uh, Butts Hill on the 8th of August. The man in charge was a Colonel John Jacobs for most of the time. He and General Heath had a little run in, then Colonel Ebenezer Thayer got put in command for a couple weeks until that was settled. Their time that they enlisted for ran out at the end of October. So we're talking from the 8th of August to the end of October, most of the work on the fort occurred. We'll talk about after that period later. We know that there were some French Masons involved. There are orders from General Heath putting Colonel Green's first Rhode Island Continentals up there in November. But I have a bunch of other stuff that makes me think he never got there. So this is a cloudy question yet, whether they were up there and what they did if they did get there. We know from a French orderly book that supposedly belonged to Rochambeau that beginning in December, they began to put troops up there to man the fort and to continue the building. It wasn't done. And the Battle of Rhode Island Association is working on getting that book translated. So we'll, if I did this talk in six months, hopefully we'd know more to tell you. What we know about the design, we know it had ditches, because they're still there. We know the ground was hard to dig. How do we know that? We have a letter from Colonel Jacobs to, to General Heath on the September the 5th telling them about, we've got the circumference sketched out. It's 111 rods. A rod changes dimensions over time, but the standard today is five and a half yards, so 16 and a half feet. So it's a pretty big circumference. And then he gave numbers, and I'll show, show you his, his report in a minute. Six, of the 111 rods, only 16 and a half, they were able to dig down the full six feet that was required for the, for the ditch. They got 26 rods at five and a half feet, 27 rods at five feet, 38 rods at three feet, and 16 rods they were able to get a foot and a half into the ground. <clears throat> We also know that General Heath ordered the quartermaster to procure 3,600 palisades. And he gives dimensions. They've got to be 10 feet long and 
between three and five or six inches, I think, in, in diameter. Most of us think Wild West, Palisades, we're going to put a stockade up. I don't think that's the case. 3,600 things placed next to each other isn't going to get around the circumference of that. So I think what we're talking about here are those phrases that we saw back at, at uh, Brenton Point. And we know they were building stone pillars for the sally port, so that we have a sally port. And it was local stone that was being hauled up. We don't know from where. And I have another report that I found when I was going through my notes today. We also know it had an iron gate because they, they assembly ordered the island, the, uh, the iron gate and the wooden platform sold in 1782. So this is uh, Jacob's report. You can see the, the numbers. He said that the, from the surface to the, to the uh, stone was only about 18 inches. That's why. This one could only, get, they, all they could do is scra <coughs> scrape the surface, they, they, did, they couldn't get into the rock. Come on. Okay, this is a late autumn, early winter of 1780. This was mailed in February of 1781 to France. This is a Berthier brothers map. And it's got a lot of information. Notice we've got a barracks going the other way now. The, the last French map I showed you, the, it was running up and down. Still in the right part of the place. We don't know if this is that original British battery and they're not using it. I believe these three batteries are left over from that encampment we saw in 1777 on the Schiffer map. The nice part about this map is this guy was, Berthia brothers were classically trained in map making and there's a standard for colors. Black is used for earthenworks. So we know that all the outsides of the fort are to be earthen works. Red indicates stone or masonry, which is a problem because there are no big piles of stones and masonry up there. So the locals must have stole it if it really was made out of. I think up until now, we have pretty well thought that that was just another wood frame building. But this map is saying it was projected or, or was stone or masonry. And the gumdrop yellow is used to indicate proposed work. So at the time they sent this map, now remember, our guys from Massachusetts left in October. The French started building in December and February and all the way until they leave in June. So it was incomplete. And he's showing the status when he made the map that it's, it's projected works. Okay, when the French leave in June of 1781, but not all of them left. Each of the four regiments left 125 men behind, so there were Six, uh, 500 French troops still on Aquidneck Island. Massachusetts was asked by Rochambeau to send 500 troops to, 
and the Rhode Island contributed another 500. So there were 1,500 troops there. What was their purpose? The fleet didn't leave. The troops left, but you can't march gunboats over land. So they stayed here to wait orders. They finally left in, in uh, middle of August, but the troops stayed. So was the fort used? Yes. In the middle of July, we get an ad hoc regiment formed out of mass militia under Colonel William Turner, and they were stationed there until the end of November. The end of November, all the guns had been moved out by then, all the ammunition was gone, and Colonel Turner turned it over to the senior ranking person in the state, Captain, I can't remember his name. <clears throat> It'll come to me. But there was a captain down in, in Newport. He only had a, a hundred men or so. He could not man North Battery and uh, Breton's Point and up here. So they, the, the state made the decision to close this down. Guns were removed. They were sent over to Tiver Tiverton and to North Battery. Ammunition was put up into the Providence arsenal. Uh, not all the guns w went. Apparently our credit wasn't very good at that point in time. <laughs> and the locals wouldn't haul the guns for them. So it took a while until we, things improved. In 1782, they finally got the last three or four guns moved out and up to Providence. As you know, the, the outline of the fort is still there. This is a map from, some, from 1819. Looks kind of like what we saw in the, the other maps, but that's really all we know about the fort. So the Battle of Rhode Island people who have got the committee to rebuild the fort are trying to put all these pieces together to come up with what the fort looked like. Or the, the goal is to match that 1781 map as best we can, but there are things we don't know. Let me go back to that again. There's no embrasures. How are they going to defend it? There are none of those outlying forts anymore. So obviously people could land at uh, Howland's Ferry come up. They could land from Bristol and come up. We need some protection. And I think that's where those palisades that Heath ordered come in. Because I think that's what, what the object is, is that we're going to put on the likely avenues of approach, we're going to put the, the phrases in. And 3,600, I haven't worked out the math yet, but that's probably a reasonable number for, to do the most obvious sides. So that's where we are. I guess we're ready for questions. I have a question. OK. How did they feed 500 men a day? Um, it's obvious they had a problem with that, too. Our credit wasn't good. There are times when they had, had no food. Um, but the quartermaster, and they had contractors, and, and it came through the system. But it was, it was tight. Because most of the food that came into Rhode Island at that time was coming from Connecticut. So you're having to transport everything from Connecticut and then down to the island and then up the island to these people. So it's a long, these guys are sitting at the end of the strip, but they're always complaining about food. They're not getting their full ration. And it's very typical in 1781, 82, to cut the rations of the troops to get by and not let them go away. The biggest complaint the troops had was they couldn't get fuel. They did their own cooking. If you don't have wood, how do you? 
So now you got trouble with people breaking down houses or sheds or trees in the backyard. So you've got a real, so the lack of wood is, is a, a morale and a, a discipline problem. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just a quick question from Robert on Zoom. You would just, could you say what the yellow is again? The yellow is, is uh, the symbol that they use for projected works. Got it. Thank you. Yes, sir. You probably know, but one of the reasons for the soil problem in Fort Butts is the fact that there was a coal mine underneath there in the early 19th century. Hmm. And the, the base of the fort itself now is a lot of slate. It was an unsuccessful coal mine, but it was there for about 15 years. There were three different coal mines in that area. The one was right directly under the fort. Hmm. I knew there was coal on the north end of the island, but I thought it was much deeper and over closer to the west shore. Yeah, in that area, yeah. yes. Those were the successful ones, and they were there for most of a century. Uh, the one that came in from the east main road, there's a gas station there now. The gas station lost part of its property because it collapsed into the mine shaft, but that one wasn't very successful. Okay. And, and Portsmouth coal generally was, was questionable. It was anthracite. It was it burned too hot. They couldn't use it in home mm -hmm. furnaces. Okay. Used for industrial purposes. I've looked at the geological map of Rhode Island, and the same symbol is up at Butts Hill as is at uh, Tomany Hill in, in that same hard shale. Yeah, it's tough soil, although a lot yes, of the soil was removed over the years because people put a baseball field in there. Hmm. I have a question about the Iron Gate. And with the, with the Iron Gate being where the Sally Port was done? Uh, the only no thing we know about it is that the assembly ordered it sold, sell the iron gate at auction. And we have no idea of whether it was a Sally Port gate or some other gate. An iron gate went up for auction, but I can't find the auction notice in any of the newspapers. So I'm not sure how that happened. Yes, sir. Yeah, could you describe for everybody what a Sally Port is? Because there's some confusion. You're, you're being an engineer. I think, in the strictest sense of Sally Port, if you have a, a wall, a building wall, and you want to get people from one side to the other, you carve a little tunnel at the base and comes through. That's usually what a Sally Port is. At West Point, all the barracks had Sally Ports, and the, and the troops came marching out for parade. Uh, I. I think in general use, Sally Port can be defined as any entryway. Um, in the, most castles, you have the Sally Port with a drop drawbridge. I don't think we had that. It, it may just have been a simple way to close off the gate so people couldn't get in or troops couldn't get out at night. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So I'm um, looking at the maps. Where does the Battle of Rhode Island actually fought? The Battle of Rhode Island. Let me see if I have a. Uh, I have to reboot again here. So, John, the red here—that's the the red tri uh, rectangle. That's the barracks, right? Yes. Okay. And just a uh, request from Zoom, if you could repeat the question. When you get an audience question, you okay. just repeat it. So the question on the table is, where was the actual battle fought? Relative to the fort, right? Yes. Okay. Let me get my slides back here. Now, I'm not an authority on battles. I cl buildings, I'll take uh, and forts, I'll I'll take on. But to my knowledge, is most of the battle was down between Quaker Hill. Butts Hill, um, what's the other hill? Turkey Hill. Turkey Hill. It, it's in this valley in between those three hills is where, where the, most of it is. The uh, monument now that's on the highway is somewhere down in that valley. Is that good enough? Yeah. Another question over in there. Yes, ma'am. So on, on, the, on the map that you have, is you have 
I haven't been to Butts Hill recently. So is the outline still there of the fort and is the other readout that they don't that they didn't use, is that still there? Okay, let me go back to that picture. The question is does it still look like this today? And if I understand your question, you wanted to know if we see that today? Right. As best I know, no. But I haven't, that's private property. Robertson doesn't go on private property unless invited. So I have not been there. The uh, Battlefield Association has been clearing for the last couple of weeks or the last month or two. And as part of that, they did some drone work. And there's a good drone flyover of the area. I studied that, slowed it down, inched through it. I do not see that there. But if we go on the ground, we may, we may see it. We're, we're going up on Saturday and walk it with, so we, we, we may know something more after Saturday. Yeah, has any LIDAR been done? Yes. Yep. And it looks just like that. It does. Yep. It looks exactly like that. So, so the, the LIDAR is showing the... Not that? Not that thing, but, okay. but that, that shape. The LIDAR looks very much like it. Cool. Another question. Yes, sir. The water tower that exists, where is that in relationship? Yeah. Water tower. Where is the water tower that's up there? That's right about here, as best I, I remember. And the... Uh, Two of them. Oh, there are two of them now? Yeah. And then I, I believe the uh, wind turbine is down in the, down in this area. Yeah. And the school, the high school is? What's the high school? The high school is all in here. Okay. And there's a stone wall across the bottom here that they've uncovered. Yes, sir? Yeah, you talk about the palisades being ordered. Uh, I bet you it was probably hard to get all that wood, especially since everything was clear cut pretty much on the island, yep. unless that wood was to come in from uh, North Massachusetts or Connecticut or such. So maybe that's why the Palisades were never built. Well, we don't know that they weren't built. Right. We know they were ordered. Mm -hmm. um, Heath left, so we have no two star general mm -hmm. pushing on the quartermaster. Um, I know that Colonel Green who took over responsibility for the American troops after Heath left. Mm -hmm. I have one piece of paper where he mentions that they're still working on getting them. Mm -hmm. So it's all probability they never came because by the time they would have come, the people to put them in would have been gone. So. Right. And just one other thing I wanted to offer about the gates. I gave a talk uh, a couple of months ago to the uh, National Association of Federal Retired Employees in Portsmouth. And at the end of this talk, I was talking about Fort Buzz, this gentleman comes up to me, and, and I think his name, he says to me, I know where the gates are. And uh, I didn't have the president's mind. I had so many people ask me questions. He and his wife said, I know where the gates are. I said, well, where? He said, I, we had a talk in Newport, and this historian told us with, uh, with surety it was, uh, that it's the old Firestone estate, uh, Powell and uh, Powers in Annandale, the old Firestone estate, that the gates were over there somewhere. So that's now, now, seeing you're saying they're in Newport, right. I would say that we need to be careful now yes. because the lines around Newport were closed every night by big wooden gates. And those were sold at auction. Again, I could never find the auction. Right. So we don't know. But there, there are. That's a good point, yeah. So, so could, again, if I could ever be see those. this gentleman again, I'm going to ask him more, uh, to get more information. Well, right. you, need, you need to it's find that guy. Yeah, He's I got to find that guy. A iron. Any other questions? Cast and riveted. Yes, sir. Currently, you show the Sally Port coming out on this particular map, and it goes over to what we would call uh, 138, which is the main East road. road. Now, the current gate to the fort comes up Battery Lane, which comes off. So was that a WPA gate opening that was done at that time? And uh, is the Sally Port still buried archaeologically? 
On the ride down here tonight, I heard, heard the first explanation of why that opening is where it is now. And, and apparently the farmers up in that area cleared that out to get into there. Right. And so it was not WPA. Okay, but it's, it's pretty shallow ditch work at that particular point, which is hard Again, again that we, it depends on what the hardness is. We don't know that they ever got to all the, all the ditches to six foot. So the current, the current gate that goes in is not where the Sally Port gate was going in it. As best I know, the, the current gate comes in up in here right, somewhere. Right, that's what I would think, because the Sally Port gate is below. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'll just check it to see if they have any more questions. Not on Zoom, no. We're all set on Zoom. Okay, okay well, that's Thank it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank if you. anybody's interested in a, in a book, there are some for sale. And uh, anybody who, I see a lot of people carrying them around. If you want it signed, I'll be happy to sign it. Yeah. So again, I just want to say my name is uh, Dr. Murray Norcross. I'm the director for grants for the Battle of, Associ Battle of Rhode Island Association. And John, we have a small presento for you. Mm -hmm. We have a Battle of Rhode Island hat. Wow. <laughs> which is really, really cool. And we also have uh, one of our two-inch uh, brass coins here, the Battle of Rhode Island coin with the Butts Hill Restore uh, Protect on the back side. I saw those these, on the website these, the other day. Right, these coins are available for sale out here if people would like, and again, proceeds are going to help us restore the court. So thank you very much. Is a challenge point. Does one officer do other? Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.